Hi everyone, this is Adam Hopps from the National Operations Center of Excellence. We're going to go ahead and get started with uh, this month's Talking Tim webinar series. Uh, as always, I'd like to thank Jim Ostrich and Paul Joden for uh, allowing us to host uh, this, this important webinar series every month. Um, just to let everybody know who's maybe joining us for the first time, uh, past uh, Talking Tim webinar series and, and all of NOCO's uh, webinars are available on our YouTube channel. Uh, there's, a, there's a link there in that useful links box towards the bottom right of your screen. So be sure to check out that page and, and, and follow us there to, to get a recording of today's, uh, of today's webinar uh, as well as um, uh, past uh, Talking Tim webinars. Uh, we also set up uh, pages on the NOCO website uh, that have all the presentations available for download. That will be up within the next week or so uh, for this webinar in particular. Um, so be sure to check out uh, both our website and to register for our newsletter uh, to get updates uh, when the recording and the, uh, the presentations are available for download. So again, uh, this webinar will be recorded for you to share with all your uh, colleagues. Um, as always, and the presentations will be available within a week. Uh, you know, so sign up for the uh, newsletter uh, to get that notification. Um, before uh, turning it over to, to Jim and our fantastic presentations today, uh, uh, Paul and Jim are allowing uh, us to, to do a little bit of an overview of NOCO uh, for those who maybe uh, aren't uh, as familiar with us or maybe only through this webinar series. So just real briefly, the National Operations Center of Excellence uh, has been around for five years. Uh, our, our mission is to enable TISMO practitioners, transportation systems management and operations practitioners which of course includes Tim, uh, uh, to basically do their jobs. We do this via, via developing resources, holding peer exchanges, um, and, uh, uh, and webinars like this, uh, as well as uh, tackling issues such as workforce development uh, to try and help people and improve the transportation workforce. Uh, I'll put our URL up there on the screen in a moment. Uh, the NOCO Knowledge Center uh, link is, is there. And if you're ever able to, take a look briefly at our um, website where we host, as I said, all of our resources, including um, the in webinars like this, are in the NOCO Knowledge Center, uh, which you can see here. Um, everything's easily searchable. Uh, things like most recent on-demand learning, such as webinars, are in here. You can see a link to the Talking Tim webinar series in May. Uh, and then via our homepage, you can see uh, all the key activities that are going on at the National Operations Center of Excellence, including uh, case studies, which we release on a weekly basis, uh, these case studies cover uh, the wealth of TISMO activities, including quite a few uh, TIM um, activities. And I know a lot of you on the phone have, have helped develop these case studies. Uh, you can see uh, the one that went up this week is about New Jersey uh, and using TISMO uh, for, for Super Bowl for the Super Bowl uh, there. So um, be sure to check out these uh, for any anything that you're looking for uh, that might assist your agency uh, to, to help implement. Um, uh, uh, TISMO or, or, or TIM strategies or, or projects, uh, they're short, they're quick, they're to the point, uh, and uh, we, we feel like they're helpful uh, for everybody to, to learn about what the best practices going on around the country. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Ostrich to talk a little bit about Traffic Incident Response Week. Thank you, Adam. And good afternoon. Welcome to uh, all. As usual, we see uh, many of our friends across the National Tim uh, community across the land. I want to give a shout out again to Adam. Paul and I are very grateful to Adam and the National Operations Center of Excellence for, for their support and, and the great work they're doing. They've grown uh, quite a bit over the past five years, and we encourage you to uh, visit the site uh, often uh, and uh, check out all the different resources that are made available there. So uh, Paul and I have made it a habit uh, now, especially now because of the uh, uh, alarming rate that our responder uh, community is being struck and killed um, more so than in recent years. Hopefully, you know, we're halfway through the year, but hopefully this will, will not continue for the balance of the year. Uh, but you can see here the, the numbers. I, I want to apologize as well uh, because there were some recent numbers that were published that were much higher than this, and uh, we've made corrections uh, and, and 
I believe are more are showing you here more accurately what the numbers are. We're 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 in the we're defining uh, what is really a struck by uh, more precisely for your information, but it has to be uh, whereby a responder, whether police, fire, rescue, EMS, tow, or transportation, public works, uh, or other responder, uh, in the course of their uh, duty out on our nation's highways and byways, roadways, uh, working a crash, uh, other type of incident on the roadway, police uh, writing citations, for example, it could be an, an ambulance out in a rural area. Um, perhaps, you know, unfortunately and very tragically being struck by one of the D drivers as we know them, distracted, drunk, drowsy, drugged, uh, d disabled, whatever the case may be. So uh, if, if it doesn't meet that criteria, uh, we're, we're, we're going to do a much better job, make sure that even though a tra tragic, you know, as it may be, there are other instances where responders are, are being killed and struck outside of the roadway system. Uh, still don't want to minimize that. But anyway, these are the numbers. And, and, and the reason why we're doing what we're doing across the number, across the nation rather, with uh, training responders and traffic incident management good practices, whether in person or online e-learning, the National Highway Institute's website or respondersafety.com. Our friends over there, Jack Sullivan and Steve Austin, who are doing great work um, promoting the training. All the training is free, as you know, and so we have to do something to try to stem the tide of, the, of, of these horrendous fatalities. Uh, and it's motorists too, by the way. We're, we're learning that motorists on the side of the road, I, recently I heard down in Texas there's one particular jurisdiction that, that has many motorists being struck and killed on the side of the road. And in terms of move over laws, um, you know, the, the laws uh, are important and, and motorists need to be educated certainly more about this, this horrendous trend that continues on. Uh, and so uh, the injuries uh, not to be minimized either, which we often say are 10 to 20 times more uh, than that of the uh, fatality. So um, let me see here. Like to talk a minute, share with you uh, regarding National Traffic Incident Response Awareness Week that this year we celebrate again the second week in November. Paul and I, and with all of you in collaboration, we need to grab a hold of our public affairs offices, PIOs, and and all of those that can help us market. Uh, what we're doing in traffic incident management and certainly the struck by uh, situation that I just mentioned, uh, not just during this week, every day of the week, but certainly during this week as we approach, uh, you'll see here in a minute, we're, we're ramping up our planning calls for uh, all the different activities that you as state leaders, you know, leaders, 10 champions in your states, uh, are, are going to be um, initiating or conducting various activities to commemorate this week. And uh, we need to, again, raise the bar and, and shout out what the responder community is doing, the transportation, as well as public safety, towers and others are doing for the, the public. You can see our slogan for this year, Traffic Emergency Actions Matter. Be a part of the team. Um, so the planning calls uh, this year, hopefully we're going to have all 50 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico participate. I'm hopeful that that will be the case. Last year we were at about 36, 37. Our contractor over again at Fleming, um, Chuck Yorks and Laura Matowski, uh, Eric Renzel and company, and the whole Federal Highway team, Paul Jode and I and, and all of you, we need to collaborate very strongly during this week. And um, 
we'll talk more about that later. Here's the, the planning call schedule that I've mentioned. Uh, take note of this. You're going to be receiving uh, email regarding this upcoming announcement, as it says in the bottom bullet there. But that gives you the what, when, why, and how. Again, our slogan, so I, I urge you, I encourage you to partner with Federal Highway, Paul and I, and, and the whole team again to, to bring attention, shine the light on this, uh, this week that's coming up. One of the big things I want to share is the success that we had uh, recently, June 5th, and I guess I could have started with this, but I, it's fine. I think ending with it is apropos, and that is on June 5th, thanks to ITS America and, and the National Operations Center of Excellence in, in collaboration with um, Safe Highway Matters, I think it is, Adam, or Travelers Marketing who was a sponsor, and um, uh, the other insurance, there was an insurance organization. Was it State Farm, Adam? I, f I forget. Correct. I apologize. Yes, State Farm and AECOM. And AECOM, thanks, Adam. We had an incredible uh, an incredible responder day at ITS America on, on June 5th. Uh, the morning kicked off a, a variety of activities, but it was just, a phenomenal day. Paul and I and all of us and, and many of the presenters today were there and uh, the morning session got kicked off with over a hundred participants uh, uh, you know in, a, in one of the rooms at the DC Convention Center and uh, we talked briefly for a couple minutes each about why we do what we do and, and the reason why Tim is so important etc. And from there we had you know, different activities during the day in addition to great displays, exhibits on the floor from New Jersey DOT and Maryland DOT's uh, Safety Service Patrol Program and um, uh, outdoor exhibits as well and uh, testimonials from responders that have had been struck and lived to tell about their, their story and, and just a lot of camaraderie, a lot of interaction including the end of during the end of the day on Wednesday the 5th June 5th we we had a an after action report discussion regarding some major incidents that had occurred recently in the national capital region of Maryland DC Virginia so uh, I just can't underscore and, and and emphasize enough that our job isn't done you guys should know I'm pretty sure you know we still have over a million responders to train. Uh, the job is not yet done. Uh, Paul and I are working on other initiatives regarding the broader TIM programs with um, projects regarding data collection and UAS and other technologies that are out there. Paul's been very engaged in that and uh, thankfully our, our leadership at Federal Highway is supportive of us. And so uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you as always, and keep up the good work. Next, I want to introduce uh, Jason Josie from Georgia DOT, one of those champions that's been with us for a, a long time, and uh, the great work that Josie's uh, doing in, uh, in Georgia. So with that, Josie. Thanks, Jim. I also want to um, give a special thanks to uh, Paul Jordan and FHWA and uh, National Operations Center of Excellence uh, for your support and opportunity to um, uh, uh, shine some light or give us, give us a chance to shine some light on something that we've been working on. So as you can see on the screen, the uh, Safety Service Patrol Industry Association is uh, uh, an association that uh, the Georgia Department of Transportation, Maryland DOT, Tennessee DOT, Minnesota DOT, North Carolina, Travelers Marketing got together to put uh, a platform on the table for all states that have a safety service patrol or an emergency response unit of that like in its state. What we found out is that uh, over time, everybody runs into particular problems or issues uh, that are pretty unique to their state and their area, but also recognize that we share some common uh, problems and issues that uh, 
if there was a platform for us to get together and, and, and cross-check one another and, and share information, uh, we would be better off. And so the association uh, is our uh, idea of bridging the gap between states to have that ability to communicate with one another. And so our association's mission primarily is to uh, promote and foster the communication and exchange of ideas and, and best practices among uh, sacred service patrol professionals uh, across the nation. Also to improve individual and collective proficiency of the members and, and, and the performance of their duties in those services. And of course, in, encourage camaraderie, uh, camaraderie and educational opportunities among uh, the SSP members is a big deal for us, and so we want to be able to have a place where we can share that thing uh, or those things uh, with each other, and everybody can stay on the same sheet of music. We also want to advocate and, and strive for uniform applications of practices and, and increase the safety of our personnel because, quite frankly, uh, we're in the teeth of the dragon when we're out there patrolling uh, the interstates uh, for the states as force multipliers uh, for other agencies that are responding and oftentimes being the first individuals on the scene to be able to hold it down until uh, the other agencies arrive. And so because of that, uh, our importance to the state's DOTs and the motoring public is tremendous. And so we feel like uh, this is a golden opportunity to put together something to, to, to allow states to kind of share those best practices uh, to increase the safety of our personnel while we're out there responding to accidents, incidents, and supporting the moral public. Uh, we also want to create and, and maintain an, an esprit de corps uh, to ensure commitment of, of duty under all conditions and circumstances uh, for the SSP community. Uh, and that includes cultivating the spirit of, of mutual cooperation among the members and the people we serve, and, and, and in no short form to, to, to basically just improve our profile to the public and those other agencies so they can be fully uh, educated and aware of who we are, what we are, and our role in emergency management and response. And uh, finally, to increase the efficiency of SSP professions and, and, and thus more, more firmly you know, establish the, uh, the confidence of the public and, I don't know, servicing the, the, and, and dedicated to the safety of the responders uh, that, that are out there on the highway. So this is a big deal for us. And we think that it's a time, an idea whose time is, is way overdue. And so, uh, if you would look at your screen, you'll see that on the files to download, there's the SSPIA newsletter. That is the first newsletter uh, of our association. It was introduced at the, um, uh, at the, at, at, at the Responders Day in, in Washington, D.C. on June that, 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 that Jim uh, spoke about. And you download that, and that will give you the perfect uh, snapshot of our full intentions and give you an idea of the energy uh, that these states and individuals have uh, going into this. Uh, my email address is going to be in the chat box. If you're interested in continuing to receive these uh, newsletters, uh, just hit me up and, and we'll make sure that we get you on a mailing list so we can shoot them out to you so you can share with your personnel. In our opinion, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Uh, because we're on the front lines of what states um, have invested in to, to, to make sure the motoring public is uh, moving efficiently and effectively and safely. And because we know we're on that front line, we want to make sure that we are locking on state to state in terms of making sure that we're all on the same sheet of music and recognized um, as equal emergency responders on the interstate. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Justin. Uh, to, 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 to give you some information, but by all means, if your state has a service patrol, I encourage you to really give this a read, reach out, and, and, and join the uh, movement. Thanks. Justin. Thank you. So I'm from Oregon Department of Transportation, and I was asked today to present basically about our annual conference that we have coming up. Some of you may have attended last year. 
Um, it's going to be September 25th in Salem, Oregon. Um, we kind of changed it around a little bit this year. In the past, we've done you know a lot of presentations at our Hall of Heroes at our um, safety standards and training building here in Salem. And this year, we decided we changed it up a little bit, and we're going to do half the day is all outside. So we'll have some crash investigation stuff. We'll have some towing. We'll have a presentation in the morning, but the rest of it will be outside in the afternoon. Um, feel free to come. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any money to pay for travel for um, a peer exchange type of uh, setup. But if you're able to get away and your agency is willing to send you, then by all means, please come visit us September 25th in Salem. Um, the next thing is we have a YouTube video that we just created using Federal Highway Money. And the link will be provided to you if you would like to go view it or share it in your crew meetings. Um, this is something we've been working on as a training promotion video for the TIM program here. So, um, if, Adam, if you want to go and play that. When we arrive on the scene, it's absolutely critical that we make sure that we're safe. It's vital that those different first responders are on the same page and that they're looking out for each other. Working together is hugely critical. Cops get hit by vehicles on the side of the roadway more than they get shot. Firefighters get hit by vehicles more than they die in fires. One power a week is killed in this country on the side of the road. Everyone's got to learn how to effectively communicate on that scene with everything going on around you. Because if folks are not operating with the same mindset, that's going to increase the likelihood that there's going to be something uh, negative that occurs. What's unique about the Traffic Incident Management Program training? not just fire training with fire, law enforcement training with law enforcement, tow training with tow. You have all the different response disciplines together in a single room. Talking about their same experiences, receiving the same training, it gives you that broader perspective of what everybody else's role is, and this is the perfect opportunity to ask the questions that you might have wanted to ask on a scene in a welcoming environment. It very much takes real-life scenarios and breaks down how it could have been done better. There were a number of things I learned I was able to put into place right away. You learn things that you probably didn't think you needed to know, the kind of stuff you learn working with all the different disciplines. If you work in dispatch or communication, if you work on the side of the road, you should be taking this training. It costs you absolutely zero to sign up for it. You'll learn something that could potentially save a life. If I can save one person's life, it's worth all the time in the world. This promotes our, our training and also has the event bright information at the end, and that's the program, or the website, I guess I should say, that we use to schedule people for training. So if you guys would like to use this, feel free to use it. Um, if you want to use it as an example of building your own video, then by all means, get in touch with me, and we can we can help you kind of steer you in the direction of kind of the ideas and concepts that we use. But I would love to see everybody on September 25th, so if you would like to visit us in Oregon, please feel free to email me. Um, we're also soliciting interest for a peer exchange on the 26th. So if you are interested in coming for a peer exchange, um, please email me and let me know. That's all I got. Thanks, Justin. Um, and just for everybody to see there, uh, under the useful links box uh, at the bottom is the traffic incident management video for download. We know video isn't perfect uh, over the webinar system, so be sure to go and, and check it out there uh, using that link. Uh, next up is uh, Paul Jordan. Thanks, um, Adam and Justin and Jason and uh, and uh, and Jim. And um, I just wanted to comment a little bit on each one of those um, things. So on Responder Day, um, you know, where it was a great event. It's probably my one of my favorite days of the year is Responder Day when I'm able to attend. Both Jim and I were both able to attend this year. And um, man, we had we had so many cool people, so many great. Um, people that we've been working with for a long time, ITS America. And uh, we're planning on doing another event. I believe the same committee is planning on doing another event. Adam and Jim, in particular, were in the middle of planning it this year. But we're going to. Um, there's going to be another planning uh, that I think will be stood up pretty soon. I'm hoping in next year. It's, I it's ITS World Congress, so it's, a, it's the World Congress. And I think they're looking to do something. I think it's in San Diego, Adam. I don't know. Los, right, Angeles. Yeah, Los, Los Angeles. Los Angeles. 
Yeah, California. So okay, I had the right state. Um, the uh, I, I just want to encourage everybody that that uh, safety service patrol that Jason had mentioned is a um, uh, the association is uh, I can tell you it's it's a small group right now, but there are some impressive people on that group. Lots of experience, probably a few hundred years of experience uh, in service patrol. So um, you know, it, just listening to some of these experts uh, in, in in their calls um, and their activities is um, I think extremely beneficial. Um, I can speak directly because I'm um, on the Oregon conference. I've been to the last couple of conferences, and um, and and they are truly um, well done events. Um, um, and then on the video, I just um, I wanted to uh, mention there was two ladies on that video that were non-traditional, what I call non-traditional partners. Uh, one is a marketing expert um, uh, that has um, been extremely helpful to the Oregon TIM program. And then the other is a, and I don't know what her title is, so I don't want to mess it up, but she is instrumental in, in, in helping develop some of the marketing materials. Um, uh, the, the, the Tim program managers aren't exactly um, experts in marketing and, and, and marketing materials, so they have engaged um, others to be part of their team, and they are truly part, part of their team because um, I've met them all a few times. So um, uh, just something to consider uh, to as additions to your team out there. So I just wanted to do run a brief um, a brief. Um, overview of something that Jim and I are working on. We're working on um, CAD integration. Uh, I know there's a lot of CAD integration throughout the country, um, but not enough. This is technology that's that's available. There's always been there's been pushback from law enforcement, but there has been progress made. We think though that not enough progress is made and I just wanted to for those of you that aren't um, uh, convinced. I just wanted to do a brief overview of why we think it's important. So, um, you know, most incidents we're missing a lot of incidents. So, if we're collecting data through the crash reports or the, through the TMCs, the TMCs are certainly missing a lot of the incidents. Uh, and, and it may not be specific to our area, but certainly nation, certainly nationally, um, you know, the TMCs, for example, are receiving a small of uh, the incidents, but uh, by integrating with the with the CAD systems, they're um, able to get um, real-time data, which has been a problem. Sometimes we, in transportation anyway, find out you know um, several several minutes after an incident has occurred. Um, uh, the um, but folks with the technologies available are increasingly starting to share data, saying to the center to center. Um, public safety agencies um, re re respond to many types of events that they, not just crashes that, that they may, may or may not need um, information from or, or assistance from DOTs, for example, or the other disciplines. Um, the incident that comes into CAD can be shared with uh, travel information, which would be beneficial. And uh, we're a firm believer now in the, um, the CAD data is really the way to go. Um, uh, getting the, the, the TIM performance measures in the crash reports is fantastic. It's, it's, uh, the TMCs is great. Crash reports is better. But CAD is the way to go if we really want to get a sufficient enough, uh, enough data to, uh, to really talk about our programs. Um, there's been um, work in this area for a long time. Many of you know this already. It, there was a field operations test in 2006 six that demonstrated real time uh, data exchanges between um, law enforcement and TMCs um, but the um, the uh, you know they were automatically sharing CAD CAD the CAD system and the TMC operating systems um, and it really has helped when when it when it does work TMC awareness we have some examples of that um, once once that integration does take place um, it also um, enables the TMCs to up understand what's happening as as the the, um, the, the incident is is emerging and uh, for, for but uh, it, it and it also helps with the travel information. So the the team that we uh, had contracted to help us um, identified uh, four levels of CAD TMC integration. Uh, level four is a seamless and automatic transfer of CAD data into the TMC traffic operation systems. 
to create an incident in the event in TMC software. So it's seamless. So it happens the CAD system goes right into the ATMS software and uh, in you go. Level three uh, has been identified as a CAD feed that's provided to the, T to the TMC system that the operator um, needs to review um, and accept uh, and then and or retype into the TMC software. So it's a little bit more, a little bit more um, time consuming, but still very, very good, um, a very good exercise uh, to be able to see that information directly from the law enforcement. Level two, with TMC operators can view the CAD data feed and must retype any information. So they're actually, they actually have to have to, you know, almost like um, there's not a billion notification. It's really you're just observing, observing what you know what what is happening, um, and then then maybe pull some stuff and then and then start the TMC procedure, whatever they need to do relative to the incident. And then level one, we the TMC receives incident information via telephone, no CAD really, uh, no data. So um, you know that there are different levels throughout the country. Uh, this is the map. Basically, the uh, level four is the dark blue, and then the lighter you get, the um, uh, you know, the lower the level, I guess. Um, but uh, um, and then there's a there's the, the states that have the combination of CAD and data sharing there on your map. So we have a long way to go, I think, with CAD, and that's why uh, Jim and I are going to be working in this area over the next few years. We're going to be trying to work with people and try to um, see what we can do to um, to enhance the use of CAD, uh, integrated CAD, um, as we move forward, at, and to, you know, into uh, you know another aspect of using technology to enhance um, uh, to enhance on scene or to reduce on scene activity. So um, we are going to. Um, if that's the wrong one. There was one on CAD, the levels of CAD. This is the newsletter one. Well, let's answer this one then. <laughs> so, uh, and and um, and and um, planning for a presentation that's coming up. Do you guys have? Does anyone have a? Uh, can you answer the question about the newsletter? Do you have a, a Tim related newsletter locally or statewide? And could could you guys chime in on that question? The ball up on the screen should be the uh, describe current level of CAD integration. The newsletter. Okay, I see some people. Um, most people are in the develop uh, developing one, and then some people uh, no. Very few of those the newsletters that are out there. I, Oregon has one. Um, not sure why. Justin's not saying yes, but um, maybe he had to drop off. But um, uh, and uh, that now Maryland is is going to be another one that we'll talk about. Hey, well, I think you might be looking in the presenters area that just you and I are seeing out on the the, the main screen that the participants are looking at. They're answering the question on the describe oh. the current level of CAD integration. It looks like we're getting decent responses. OK. Well, why don't you uh, read that, because I can't see it. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I sorry. Think just, it looks like, uh, uh, looks like about 40% of people are saying they have a limited exchange of info, uh, phone call, email between public safety agencies. Uh, another 25% are saying that public safety CAD is electronically transferred to TMC software. Um, another 20% says TMC views public CAD. Um, or media CAD from uh, public safety agency, and then about 15% says dedicated public safety computer for special access to BUSA. Excellent. Okay, we'll we'll use that information as we move forward. Uh, appreciate your everyone's input, and um, uh, we'll continue. Uh, so, okay, so why why focus on TMC CAD integration? Many of you, because I know many of you that are on the 
on the um, on the webinar today are, are already sold on this. But for those of you that aren't, um, you know, we're, we're you know we become more f sophisticated. We have to start or, or continue to expand our use of technology, uh, and CAD is is um, is one way to do it. it uh, really feel that we can, you know, when you go back to the Tim training timeline, it reduces the um, it can it can reduce that time that we're, we're trying to figure out what's going on, that an accident a actually occurs, um, and, uh, and can help us throughout the timeline if we had that if we had Some success stories uh, when we're trying to make the business case, 30% um, reduction in incident clearance time uh, in Maryland after the DOT got act access to the state police CAD. Um, uh, in Oregon, they, they, they saw a 30% reduction in incident response time and a 38% reduction in incident duration in, uh, in, in Oregon. So um, in Virginia, 88% of the crashes in the, Virginia, in, the, in the DOT TMC system come from state police CAD. By the way, um, Maryland is feeling new integration of CAD, I believe. Uh, Oregon has had it uh, for a, a, a few years, at least a few years now, and but there's 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 in house, so they they developed the system in house is pretty cool, and um, uh, an oldie but goodie is Minnesota, who's had integrated CAD, full integration of CAD, um, Minnesota DOT and and state police uh, for 15 or so years. Uh, had integrated CAD, I don't know about full, but they were probably one of the most sophisticated for integration in the country. But they um, they were able to because they ha they were able to get the data. They have a, a module that goes with the data, um, goes with the integrated CAD, and they were able to do a benefit cost for their service patrol program from the CAD. Uh, the benefits to law enforcement um, increase safety because we, you know, because we're having a more efficient response. Um, you know, hope, generally it's a minimal cost to law enforcement because the DOT can find a way to pay for it. I think um, in many um, reduced coordination time between dispatch centers. And once you're if you're if you're part of the loop, um, then that those phone calls can can decrease, and um, obviously improve capability for, for performance measures. So the TMCs. You know, the more information, the better, generally speaking. So um, it, it increases our, the awareness. Um, it can more efficiently uh, affect DOT response. Uh, overall improvements to an incident and response clearance time. Um, uh, of course, the, um, the accuracy of data uh, is, is definitely improves. Travel information improves, and the accuracy and efficiency of the TMC. So um, you know, if, you know the benefits when you're making a business case. And by the way, these slides are available to you. Um, the sa reduces, um, sa you know, the safety. The business case is safety reduces the time. We, we feel that integration can reduce the time on scene, th th thus the exposure to responders. Um, reduces the potential for secondary crashes, of course. Uh, agency resources reduces the risk factor factor for secondary crashes, which could extend the overall incident duration time, allow more time to be spent uh, on other law enforcement functions, and of course, um, the time and money piece that we all we all talk about. So increased safety, um, saving times, lives, and money, that's the, that's the selling point. Um, greater efficiency is a no-brainer with integration. Um, I think it, it, you know one, one thing that we don't talk about enough is that integration of CAD can help with advancing the collaboration during the TIM program. Um, can really enhance that performance analysis uh, with with enhanced data, uh, improved data, the, the the quality and the quantity of the data to help with the decisions and. Um, um, you know, I guess the technical challenge has always been that institutional willingness to to, to share. So with that, that, that I'll um, introduce um, um, Mr. Scott Yinger, um, is uh, one of our um, closest friends nationally here, um, and um, always um, supportive and, um, and one of the 
certainly one of the leaders in this country when we're talking um, advancing traffic incident management. Uh, Scott um, uh, has, a, has a, um, shared with Jim and I the new newsletter that they have put together, we're very proud of, and um, it's good having a newsletter on the East Coast. Uh, so, um, But Scott's going to share a little bit of information um, with you uh, on that. So with that, um, Scott, take it over. Thank you, Paul, and uh, greetings to everyone from Maryland. I appreciate it from Paul and Jim for the invitation to present on behalf of Maryland Department of Transportation, Grady Carrick, for his help in uh, herding me together to make sure everything was prepared. And also like to thank the National Center of Excellence for this forum and Adam for your, uh, your facilitation today. Yeah, we're talking about a newsletter, and uh, I entitled this uh, Keeping Tim Traction. You know, we've been, we've been training for a number of years, since about 2013. Uh, and we were concerned in Maryland that it's uh, maybe start losing some traction, may start seeing that around the nation in your areas, and how do we keep traction under this? Uh, some of the interesting parallels today uh, on this call, uh, hearing from Justin, I, I happen to be at Justin's conference, and I reiterate what Paul said, an outstanding conference in Oregon, uh, and even before I went to Oregon last year and participated in that, you know, Darren Weaver and Justin put together a a Tim newsletter, which uh, gave me the idea of how can we better inform uh, our internal external partners about the positives of traffic incident management to keep traction uh, under the training to get to 100%. And the nice thing about this whole group in traffic incident management is uh, you can borrow an idea or steal it without feeling like you're committing a crime. So we did borrow Oregon's outstanding idea of having a Tim newsletter, and we decided to do something here. So, uh, you know, some of the other parallels that we've heard so far with uh, Jason talking about the importance of, of the association and keeping Tim traction and, and the video that was shown from Oregon. You know, I, I can't go too far past here in June uh, where a Colorado State Trooper uh, was killed out on I-70 at an incident scene struck by a driver. And, and, you know, our, our hearts and prayers are with our uh, brothers and sisters out in Colorado and everywhere else that's lost somebody. You know, yesterday was a particularly busy time in Maryland uh, for our chart teams. We responded to two separate fatal crashes involving commercial vehicles yesterday. And at the second one, not only did someone in the crash lose their life, but a firefighter that responded to the scene suffered a medical emergency and died in the line of duty. So, you know, the safety and the importance of Tim doesn't go too far away from us. But how do we keep that priority in all the other disciplines to make sure we, we reach towards 100% uh, train? So with that, you know, I look at the national benchmarks, and, and Jim goes over these things, and we want one point, almost 1.2 million people trained is, has been the goal. Uh, and we started again four or five, actually maybe even six years ago with uh, SHARP-2 uh, traffic incident management uh, four-hour responder training. Uh, we trained instructors. Uh, currently, we have about 415,000 trained, I believe. That's about 36% of what we're trying to train uh, in the United States on our way to towards 1.2 million. And currently, there's you know 12,000 instructors in the country that are trained to present this. And how I like to break that down is if you know each instructor that we had trained about 60 people, we'd be done. Uh, here in Maryland, it's very similar. We have 273 instructors. And if each instructor trained 57 new responders, we'd be at 100% in Maryland. So maybe a different way to look at it. Now, I realize all those instructors aren't necessarily viable candidates anymore. Some have retired, gone on to other things else. Quite frankly, some may not even be interested. So in keeping traction and trying to keep Tim in the forefront of all the different discipline, uh, responder disciplines' minds as to why it is important, we, we go through some challenges. You know, personnel turnover, people retire, people go into other things, uh, whether they're instructors, whether they're people we've trained, and now we're training another person that we've already trained in that position before but doesn't get us to 100%, so we strive uh, to get to 100%, uh, and we push hard to do that. Some changing, evolving priorities for different agencies. You know, there's, there's uh, as time goes on, and, and we're into probably the fifth and sixth year of training, do some priorities start to change and it's not as fresh as it once was and how do we keep it fresh in everybody's minds and we look back recently at the Colorado Trooper 
what happened yesterday in Maryland, and we can take some opportunity from those tragedies to, to get it back in the forefront of everyone's mind that traffic incident management is important. It is about safety. It is about efficiency. It's about keeping our roads open uh, and mobility and, and the economy. So, uh, you know, training time constraints. Everyone is tasked, every, every agency uh, is tasked with more and more things with less and less people. Training time uh, gets more challenged. There's constraints there, which makes it hard to fit in a four-hour course. I applaud Federal Highway for putting out the web-based training in the meantime. That helps keep it fresh, gives us some more flexibility in how we can put out and provide this training and doing that in blocks. Uh, and, and I can't get away from after five or six years of training, uh, there's some stagnation, some apathy around. Again, we look at the tragedies that occur and try to um, ensure that those heroes that died leave a legacy of making us better, those that remain here and we try to fight that apathy or stagnation that, that there are other priorities, but yet this one is incredibly important and we must, must keep up the good fight towards 100%. So Chart felt we had a story to tell, not just from our history and our past, but we have a story to tell of what's happening right now in Maryland and, and what are we about to do and what are we embarking on in Maryland. And I think every state has this. Our goal was to uh, better engage our partners and not just external partners, but these are partners from within our own state highway administration that may not know about traffic incident management, the benefits and the importance and the safety aspect and how it involves everyone in the highway department and everyone in the counties, in the states and all the disciplines. How do we uh, reach beyond operations? You know, uh, it's the engineer folks, it's, it's the planners, uh, it's, it's the command staff, it's the executive leadership who may not understand operations completely, but how do we make them understand and reach them as to why this is important uh, to champion uh, this training and, and this whole profession. So we wanted to give some uh, periodic updates and news in a positive way and look at what we've done in the past, tell our story, uh, what we're doing now, what we're doing next, and not just about CHART, but about all our responders here in Maryland that contribute to the traffic incident management community. So some of our tactics. Uh, we wanted a catchy name for the, uh, the, the newsletter, and I'll, I'll bring that up in a minute, but we decided to, to name it All Lanes Open. Uh, I, I didn't realize when I came from law enforcement to, to uh, State Highway Administration about seven or eight years ago that the initials ALO would mean so much, but All Lanes Open is our goal, safely and efficiently. So we wanted a catchy name, and we decided on that. We wanted to limit it to four pages so it wouldn't get too reedy. We didn't want to make it a technical paper where we had long, drawn out, very technical articles. We wanted it to be visual. Uh, we wanted positive stories and outcomes and best practices and make sure we had a wide outreach. Uh, but we wanted it more operational based than we did technical based. So that were some of our tactics. Uh, we worked with a consultant, JMT Consultants here in Maryland. They did an outstanding job for us putting it together. We didn't have the capacity or time to do it ourselves, so we did reach out and use an external group to help facilitate getting this newsletter together. So this is some of the past stories. Some of you may have seen this before, what CHART stands for. We've been in business for 30 years. Believe it or not, we, we reached a one millionth response back in 2017. We're 24-7. Run about 2.1 million miles a year uh, proactively and vigilantly, vigilantly uh, patrolling here in Maryland and we respond to something about every seven and a half minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we save the taxpayers here in Maryland about $1.5 billion in, in cost savings to them uh, by increasing the mobility and efficiency uh, of the roadway. So another milestone that we had uh, in chart was back in 2010, we sought a sponsorship and we gained that with State Farm through Travelers Marketing. And, and one thing that we found through that uh, is that we got feedback from our motorists. They developed and had comment cards. Uh, some of our, our personnel that had been here before the expansion in 2014 were a little resistant uh, to the sponsorship, I'll be quite honest with you, but once they bought in and gave the comment cards, there were 16 questions that were asked of the motorists that we assisted on the side of the road, not at incident scenes, simply motorists that we were helping on the side of the road, about 36,000 a year or so that we assist. 
and we got important feedback from those questions, which was part of our story to tell and why we felt this was so important to reach uh, out beyond operations. So even though we've been in business for more than 30 years, uh, these comment cards told us that 67% or over, not some even weren't sure, but at least 67%, two out of every three people that we stopped and helped on the side of the road, many of which are Maryland motorists, had no idea that we existed prior to that driver walking up to that car to ask him if they needed help. I found that to be amazing and felt that obviously we're not telling our story very well if two out of three people don't even know what our service is about since the last 30 years. So what we also found very valuable was is that the people uh, felt our service was uh, strongly agreed or agreed that it was very uh, strong, that it was valuable. Uh, and that becomes very important when you're keeping and making the business case to your leadership that they find great value, the taxpayers find great value in the assistance you provide, that our drivers were uh, at least 99% of the time very or extremely professional and courteous. Uh, that became important from a very customer service standpoint, that, and it became obvious that uh, they were the tip of the spear. They, they were the ones that were actually out in front uh, demonstrating this customer service uh, for the state of Maryland, all state employees, not just MDOT, uh, and we're doing it in a very professional manner. And then the impact of SHA. So 95% of the people that we helped uh, had a more favorable opinion, opinion of the State Highway Administration after receiving the service. We could not get away from uh, all, all answers to all 16 questions, but these four were particularly impactful. So that was part of the story that we wanted to tell as well. So the first page of the newsletter looks something like this. I hope you can see it. There's kind of an index there as to, on the right side, as to what you expect to see uh, within this edition. Uh, and then there's, we had a message on our inaugural one, and this was inaugural one. It goes out four times a year to match the seasons. So we have a spring, summer, fall, and a winter edition. So every, every three months we'll be putting one out. In fact, the second one's about to come out here shortly. But we had a message from the deputy administrator as to what CHART does and some of that historical perspective, as well as what they can expect to see in this newsletter. That's kind of the front page, which we hope is very pleasing to the eye, and people tend to want to look at and hold, again, no more than four pages, so it's not too voluminous. Then we went into the second page, and we have our ERT of the year uh, that we displayed actually from 2017. The next edition will have the one from 2018. We talked about traffic incident management and chart, had some visuals on uh, response time, uh, lane clearance time, and what that means and, and why that's important. Again, telling the story of what we're doing now. Uh, and then we looked at into some of the stories as to what's happening out there, uh, an innovative recovery that we look at where we had a, a tow company actually lift a fully loaded, overturned uh, trailer that was partially compromised and slid it up onto a motorized rollback and removed it from the scene without having to offload and, and met the National Unified Goal of 90 minutes or less to clear the interstate of that, that commercial vehicle crash, as well as some other uh, information. And we encourage our external partners to write articles for this as well. We try to be inclusive of everyone to make sure they understand that this is, this is a team effort. And then the last page, we're really integrating transportation systems management and operation in the State Highway Administration here in Maryland. And we wanted a page that talked about those innovations and what do those mean and what is coming to Maryland when it comes to active traffic management uh, programs, uh, how do they benefit traffic incident management and all the incident responders, and to educate them as to what is yet to come uh, here in Maryland. So we worked hard at, at telling our story and what we have done, what we're doing, uh, and, and what we will be doing into the future. Uh, we had a wide outreach. Uh, we had pretty good response back, favorable comments, uh, nothing negative. And so we're very pleased at the first edition. And a little shameless plug here, if you want to subscribe, there's how you would email, and we'll certainly put you on the subscription list. Uh, again, I uh, want to certainly thank uh, JMT Consulting, Oregon DOT, Justin and, and Darren Weaver uh, out west for, for giving us the template to follow. Uh, we certainly hope that we're meeting, or, or at least uh, they're appreciative of our efforts to duplicate what they do and appreciate the thought.
So if you want to subscribe, there it is. <clears throat> and with that, uh, you know, that's my presentation here from Maryland, and uh, I appreciate, again, from the National Center of Excellence the time to uh, present that on this forum. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Great information. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, you know, how cool is that? You know, we have a program that's been in business for 30 years. Maryland is surely one of the top um, TIM programs in the country for a long, long time. Goes out in a relative newbie, not exactly brand new, but uh, in Oregon, as their program is much newer. Their TIM program is much, much newer. Um, but, um, you know, they learned something out there, and they took it back, and they implemented it. Um, Scott took it back and implemented it. So I think that's cool. That's what it's all about. That's why we feel these webinars are so important. That's, uh, that's fantastic. So um, uh, last but certainly not least is, um, you know, um, Brian Purvis. He's uh, on a, by way of um, full disclosure, he's one of my oldest friends in the nation on traffic incident management. Um, it, Jim Ostridge and I and Brian and several others along the um, uh, I-95 uh, were involved with the I-95 Carter Coalition. Um, we were in leadership positions, and we, we way back in the, to the 1990s, we learned we learned from each other. Mostly I was learning from um, others, but, um, uh, you know, Brian has been around for a long, long time, knows a lot about Tim, um, and, um, and just a, a, a respected Tim manager um, throughout the country. But while his, his, his job as mission of late is, um, is a unique program where it's, a, it's more of a, a rural focused um, service patrol program and he'll explain that but I, I also think that we you know in our efforts to be um, you know uh, to, to you know be all inclusive we wanted to share a little information on rural focus on traffic incident management so Brian's going to sort of accomplish um, accomplish um, both of those things at the same time, I think, today. And um, with that, Brian, if you don't mind taking it from here. All right. Thanks, Paul. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak, as always, uh, to Jim, Paul, and Adam, uh, National Center of Excellence. So uh, what I really wanted to focus in on, uh, like Paul said, was um, the, the CHAMP program. It is a, still a fairly new program to the state of Georgia and to the nation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the program is, where it is, why it's important, and then uh, some other important benefits. And uh, I know Paul's probably shocked to see the word technology on one of my presentations, but I will go into some of the things that we're, uh, we're doing. So again, it is a brand new program. Um, we got started back in November of 2016. And when I say new, I mean birthed the program from its infancy to where it is today. Um, so it took, uh, we had six months to get the uh, program implemented. Uh, we actually had patrols on the road in February of 2017. So quick math, you know, we were only a couple months out from getting that up and running and then uh, had everything completely implemented in, uh, in April of 2017. Uh, it is a statewide program, but it's kind of a, a donut effect. Um, um, you heard Jason Joseph earlier. They do a fantastic job in Metro Atlanta. And, and some of the outreaches on the, uh, the toll roads and, and managed lanes. Um, but basically the CHAMP program covers uh, rural interstate outside of metro Atlanta. Um, so it's kind of an octopus looking um, network out there. A uh, little different scenario, this is funded 100% with state dollars. Um, a couple of years ago, Georgia passed a House Bill 170 uh, increased gas tax. And the main, the primary focus of that was to provide better maintenance and operations on Georgia's uh, major highways. Um, so one of the things they did is they carved out part of that maintenance money um, and contracted this program out. So Hero and Metro Atlanta, those are state employees. Champ on the outskirts is uh, contracted staff. So a little, little different flavor. Um, so the program is is. Just like any service patrol, we patrol the roadway 16 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Uh, it is a free service to the public. They're already paying with their gas tax money, so you know there is no charge to the public. But we're basically patrolling out on the roadway from um, 6 a.m. until 10.30 p.m. at night. Uh, we also respond after hours for uh, emergency situations. 
uh, not mainly for motorist assist, but more for traffic crashes and those types of, of responses. So where are we at today? Um, we currently are covering 20 routes. Uh, when the program was initiated, we had 16 routes across the state. Um, so currently we're at 20, and we're in the process of, of expanding. So the 1,000 plus or minus miles of interstate that we're covering, um, we're now at 20 routes. We're covering about 51 miles um, on average um, for each one of those routes. We just got a um, notice to proceed, and we're in the expansion mode right now, hiring, putting out more trucks and, uh, and equipment. But we're going to 27 routes, um, which is going to lower our routes down to about 40 miles on average. Uh, the nice thing that this is doing is, is after running this program for about two and a half years, you know, we, we've got a better handle of where are we seeing issues, where do we have motorist assist needs. Um, so we're doubling up and shortening routes in a lot of those areas and making it safer and the response times, you know, drastically being cut in, in, in all these rural areas across the state. Uh, in addition to having the operators out on the roadway, we do have uh, six dispatch centers. So obviously Metro Atlanta, they've got the Atlanta Traffic Management Center. That's their main hub of operations. But there's seven districts of DOT. The District 7 is in Atlanta. The other six regions across the state, we do have dispatch centers. And, and not only is, is Georgia DOT putting money and, and resources out there with their maintenance, but the, the other nice thing is they've actually um, six of the seven dis, um, district offices are, are new facilities. So they're, they're putting their money where their mouth is and, and doing a lot as far as operations. Uh, so why is a program like CHAMP important? Why would you want to have safety service patrols out in, in rural Georgia? Um, you know, obviously the, the slides, the, the pictures on the left are Metro Atlanta. The ones on the right are obviously not Metro Atlanta. Um, so you can look, and it's a, a very visual difference in, in what we're trying to deal with. And like I said, our, our big brothers with the, the hero units and, and Jace and Josie running that program, you know, they're managing the beast. Um, Metro Atlanta is, in, you know, obviously way up in the top ten in, as far as congestion. And once you get out, the, the congestion issues drop drastically. So, so the difference between apples and oranges that we're dealing with, so in Metro Atlanta, you've got extremely high societal cost um, with, with traffic incidents. Obviously, air quality is a concern, um, but some of the benefits that they have from a, a response, and obviously this is during peak, peak times, at, at night they have a lot of the same issues we do when traffic dies off. But during the daytime, there is a, from the motorist point of view, there is a high level of um, expectation for congestion, stop-and-go traffic. Uh, the other benefits they have in Metro Atlanta is just the proximity of, of hospitals, responders, uh, fueling locations, um, any, any kind of resource you could think of is at your disposal in Metro Atlanta. Obviously, Hero being one of the premier um, service patrols in the country. Um, alternate routes and detour routes. Um, you can pretty much see an interchange looking out your windshield or out your rearview mirror. I mean, they're very close in proximity. You know, you do have a, a short distance, and, and the wagon wheel concept that they've got in Metro Atlanta, you've got, you know, basically a circular bypass and all kinds of internal routes where you can move traffic. Obviously, that traffic is congested a lot of the time, but you do have alternatives from move, where to move traffic. And then funding. Um, when you think about it, yes, you have low air quality, but you have congestion mitigation and air quality funds. You have things like travelers marketing that's looking to push out a lot of information to a lot of people. So there, there's all kinds of different funding alternatives and resources um, when you have an area as congested as, as Metro Atlanta. Out in the rural, um, we've got commerce impacts. We've got you know a high volume of, of tractor trailers out there uh, moving goods and services um, and not a lot of real estate to do it on. So they have point A to point B. Um, you know, and any time you shut down a, a rural interstate, they really don't have anywhere to go. Um, air quality, it's better out there, but that does uh, impact your, your funding in a lot of situations. But we do have a lot of safety concerns around the clock. Uh, limited resources. Um, 
a lot of locations that we've polled and, and worked with in traffic incident management teams in rural Georgia, we find out that the, the sheriffs don't work crashes. So they will go out there and do traffic control, um, you know, basically for 30, 40 minutes up to an hour waiting on highway patrol to show up and, and, and manage that crash scene and, and actually do the documentation. So that's one of the initiatives we're trying to work on because, you know, you're, you're shutting the roadway down. You're exposing the responders at that scene waiting on another entity to show up when you've got somebody there that can already do it. Um, you, so response times are, are, are tough. Uh, high fuels, I mean, high speeds, uh, just they never slow down out there in rural Georgia, and there's no expectation that you should have to. So when they come around curves or hills or just get in the doldrums in the, the zombie mode for long periods of time, and all of a sudden they see us out there, it's kind of tough. And then when you do have to shut the roadway down, um, where do you move traffic? Um, there's really nothing around you that has the volume or capacity of the interstates. So a couple other things, responder safety. Um, you know, we don't see much as far as upstream warning. Um, almost no traffic control at, at crash scenes. Um, seeing they're out there by themselves and they're waiting for long periods, they have high-intensity lights and they leave them running. It, and that's the only thing they think they've got at their disposal. So a, a lot of rural responders will have their lights just blinding at the scene because they think, well, that's how I get people, you know, way back to, to give. That's my only advance warning that I've got. Uh, we're still seeing issues with no safety vests, um, high speeds upstream and at our incident scenes. Um, a ton of the drivers, I hear these complaints all the time, and again, the zero expectation of stop and go traffic. So what does CHAMP provide? We have a, a portable sign, a uh, permanently mounted sign on the back of our truck. Um, 511GA, that's a, a mobile app that we use. Um, and obviously we have lights. We can do upstream warning. We can do cones at the scenes. Uh, when there are blinding lights, we've taught our operators to go talk to the incident commanders, talk to the other responders at the scene and show them what the issues are. Uh, safety vest. Um, we're at the point now where, you know, when we throw away old vests, we tell our guys don't throw them in the trash, throw them under your seat in the truck because if a responder is struck at a scene and he's not wearing a vest, he could lose everything. You know, it's we've got to protect the responders. We've got to make sure that they're out there um, visible at, at, at crash scenes. The safety vest is your primary uh, point of safety out there from, from a personal responder safety. Um, again, high speed, we're using things like uh, our message boards, 511, the Waze app, temporary traffic control, whatever we can do up to and including positive guidance, just being the person at the scene waving that traffic on to keep their attention um, on what's going out there. Um, motorist safety, the same issues that you have with the responder safety, um, with the additions of the blocked roadways, uh, limited resources, and rubbernecking out there. Um, so, you know, we've got push bumpers on our trucks, tow straps, J-hooks, things like that. Um, so we do work to quick, clear things when possible. A lot of the issues we run into are, are self-imposed by the motorists, um, abandoned and disabled vehicles left on the shoulder of the road. So we're out there tagging vehicles, uh, coordinating with law enforcement, calling for tow uh, rotations and things like that to get these vehicles off the shoulder of the road. Um, again, limited resources. You know, you may have six, eight miles between interchanges. You may not be able to see an interchange when you pull over on the shoulder of a, an interstate. So we are doing motorist assistance out there um, during our patrol times, and that's a huge impact. And I'll, I'll drop some numbers on you at the end of this um, to kind of give you an idea. Some of the other benefits that a program like this has. Um, you know, Metro Atlanta started out with the uh, Metro Time Task Force, which has expanded statewide now. Um, in addition to that program, which was really initially starting in, in, in Atlanta, um, this program, we've gone out, we've met with 20 uh, different counties, uh, set up, setting up traffic incident management teams, and we're expanding these across the state along the interstate corridors. Um, we've already had 49 meetings, and we've only been running our traffic incident management program for you know, less than a year and a half. So we've gotten a pretty good start, and uh, we are meeting regularly every three to four months, uh, depending on the flavor of that, each area. 
um, a lot of the stuff that we're teaching these folks is 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 really we get in and, and dig in at the county level and find out what are the issues, what do they need. Um, some of the things, like I'm showing in this slide, the 511 app. Um, Georgia has both a mobile and a computer-based app, and just letting responders know that in addition to the Sharp 2 training, you know, you can use little things like this to find the needle in the haystack, you know, find where the red zones are in the traffic and know exactly where to go to that incident scene. Also look at where the traffic backup ends so you know where to provide upstream warning. So just little tricks of the trade um, makes a huge impact on these first responders out there. Another thing that we're teaching these folks, uh, the Waze app. You know, the traveling public has their own app. And as we go to these incident management meetings and we ask the responders, just a quick poll, how many of you folks have the Waze app, you typically see about half the room raise their hand. So before they leave, we basically let them all know that you've got advanced warning. You can put in there that you've got law enforcement at a scene, that there's a crash out there. Those types of things are, are free to the responders, so why are we not using them? Um, the nice thing about Georgia is those Waze apps are actually integrated into their 511 system that their traffic management centers are monitoring 24-7. So in addition to what Paul was talking about at the beginning, this is another way that you can use CAD integration, plus you can use the motorist integration into that to have a very robust and extremely accurate um, poll of what's going on out there on your roadways. Other things we're looking into and, and, and training folks on, railroad safety. Um, there's a lot of rural, rural responders and a lot of rural um, rail out there that they're going to all the time. Um, so there's apps like Ask Rail that tells you what's on those trains, what kind of hazardous materials are you responding to. A railroad locator, because railroads don't care what intersection you're at. They want to know what rail crossing or between what multiple rail crossings you're responding to. Um, there's things like landing LZ control for life flight coordination. Uh, one that we found out in, in rural Georgia from a 911 center, we always were asking, how do you find the needle in the haystack when somebody's broke down and they're calling and asking for, you know, 511 for resources like Champ or, or, or Hero? We found a little app called Carbine, uh, a company that goes out to 911 centers and provides a, a tool where you basically, when they call your center, you ping their phone and it gives you the X, Y, and Z coordinates, the lat long and the, and the elevation, so you can find out exactly where that needle in the haystack is and respond that much quicker to the traveling public. Um, the other thing that uh, is not on the slide, but Georgia's um, done a great job with putting cable barrier along medians to protect for cross-median um, cross crashes. So we're actually going out and training responders on not cutting the cable, how to respond to it, how to pull posts, and, and how to coordinate at, at those types of scenes where you're not leaving the traffic exposed after you leave, you know, for 2,000 foot of, of down cable barrier. Uh, a couple other things we're doing. Obviously, uh, the, the Sharp 2 TIM training is near and dear to my heart. I was involved all the way back to when they had the, uh, um, the Focus State initiatives, developing the NUG and actually putting together this program. Um, so we've taken the, the federal version and, and made a, a Georgia rural training version. Um, and, and, you know, the version 3 that's out now has a lot of rural in it, so it was easy to do. But we've learned going out in these areas where you have a lot of volunteers, a lot of volunteer firemen and other folks, um, that you've got to meet when they need you. Um, they, they need a lot of them meet at nights. Um, we've done weekend training uh, for Sharp 2. We've actually gone one on, on their regular training nights on like a Monday night and done half a training one month and then come back the next month and done the other half of the training. Uh, so we've trained hundreds. I don't have accurate, accurate numbers on that, but we have done uh, about three train-the-trainer courses and had about 16 Sharp 2 training uh, courses across the state. Um, the one big thing that I'll say is, you know, Federal Highways, this is a traffic-related program. Um, one of the deficiencies that I see, and, and it's even on the national scale when you look at the reports that are sent out um, on where we're at, is look at your DOT folks. Um, you know, we went out and reached out to all the rural maintenance yards 
across the state and had an opportunity to train every one of their maintenance staff who are responding with us. Um, you know, the, the maintenance foremen in Georgia are the primary point of contact out there in the field at these crashes. So having them actually have this training means they're speaking the same language. They know who to go to. So just a huge benefit. Uh, the other thing that Champ had no uh, direct input into, but we we piggybacked off of, is in Georgia the Office of EMS requires Sharp Two training. That has helped out tremendously, and we we push and advertise that in every Tim meeting and every outreach that we do. Um, as far as where Georgia's at, we're ahead of the national average. Um, they've trained almost 8,000 in person, and a huge uptick due to the Office of EMS requirements. Um, on the web-based training of over 5,000. So we're almost halfway there, and those numbers are, are increasing pretty steadily. Uh, as far as the rural program um, and trying to justify something like this, just realize some of the huge benefits is, you know, we're responding 24-7 um, to, to incidents out there on the roadway. Uh, last month was a, a good month. We had uh, over 16,000 responses and this uh, the numbers below are just an average uh, are, are just for the month of May abandoned vehicles uh, over 1300 so basically if you took a thousand and twenty five miles there's basically a vehicle out there in rural Georgia every mile on average um, that's that's ridiculous and we've got to do a better job responding and clearing those because once they stop moving they're debris, and you should treat them as such. Get them off the roadway because they are a negative impact to safety of the motoring public and response for the uh, first responders out there. Crashes, if you're trying to justify a rural program with crashes, you're probably not going to do it. That's only about 3% of what we respond to. Uh, over 5,000 motorists assist per month. It's about 30% of what we do. But our maintenance calls, it's, it's you know 13% of what we're responding to those are things that basically every time we respond, we would have, if we weren't out there, basically the maintenance de department would have to shut down their operation during the day, you know, uh, fixing potholes, pulling ditches, putting up road signs. All of those activities basically stop and shut down um, over 2,000 times a month across the state. Um, so it keeps them more efficient during the day, and it keeps us responding quicker after hours. And then debris. There are a ton of debris calls that we respond to, and a lot of this we find ourselves. Every single one of those, over 7,000 times a month, that's something that the motoring public has to avoid. So you're talking about harsh maneuvers, uh, abrupt lane changes, and things like that. Those are all crashes, potential crashes that, that have been avoided by having a program out there. Um, I saw what Scott put out there earlier, responding every seven minutes. Uh, remember, they're in in an urban area up in Maryland. This program down at the bottom of that screen, um, just quick numbers, we worked over 9,000 hours last month. That's uh, over two stops an hour or about uh, you know almost 14 and a half stops per eight hour shift per day. So that is a lot of rural response out there on the roadway. The future, you know, I don't care how much we get into connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles, debris is still going to occur. Things are still going to fall off. There's still going to be issues. Vehicles are still going to break down, and there's still going to be crashes out there on the roadway. So look at, your, look at those types of issues. This is something you can promote on a long-term basis. Um, roadway maintenance will still be there. The roadways are always going to need to be maintained. You're always going to have to identify things and, and, and fix them as quickly as possible. And then you're always going to have responders out there that need to be protected, responded to, um, and, and looking for ways to communicate better between the responders on the scene and the motoring public that were out there to, to protect and serve. So we've always got to take that next step to figure out how to keep things safe. So with that, um, Chad Hendon, Jason Josie, who you heard at the beginning, those are two folks from GDOT that you can contact directly. Or uh, by all means, call me any time, day or night. I'd love to speak anything about Tim or this program at any time. So, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak, Paul and Jim and Adam, and uh, uh, I guess I'll turn it back over to Paul and we'll field any questions you guys have. Thanks, Brian. I don't know if they should be calling you while you're on vacation this week. Brian's speaking to us while he's on vacation. His, life was, his wife was gracious enough to let him, let him uh, participate. 
Um, you know, kudos to GDOT for um, initiating that program. Um, I think uh, I think um, I think one of our webinar topics in the future needs to be how did GDOT convince um, the the powers that be to to support um, to support such a um, uh, you know a, a, an innovative program you know rural Tim. Um, I, I I don't want to lose sight of the fact that. I was very impressed, and I think it's actually a higher number, with Brian saying that he, they have initiated TIM teams, TIM rural teams in, 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 in Georgia, uh, in addition to this statewide um, committee that they've had for many years. So um, I, I just, uh, I think, Brian, you had said it was 34 last time we spoke. Um, is, it, is it 34 or is it 20? Uh, no, it's it's 20 right now. We've got quite a few more that we're uh, in the process of developing. Um, and like I said, we've made outreach to 34 different counties already. Um, so we've got 20 active and about another 14 that we're in the process of working with. Wow, that's, uh, that's just uh, impressive. It really is impressive. So kudos to, to Georgia for uh, this program. And uh, I know Brian... Uh, as a contractor, but kudos to him for the energy he puts into it as well. So, um, you know, anyone, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, if um, you have a question, I see some people are putting it in the chat pod. I do want to uh, address, um, at least take a shot at uh, one that Robert put on um, during the CAD presentation. Um, he, he, he asked, how, how do you integrate with locals but not be overwhelmed with too much information and, and not enough resources? Well, I think you're right there, but I think he answered your own question, uh, Robert. We, um, you know, the, the idea is to start small or just take the priorities, whatever you can handle. Uh, the worst thing in the world, and we've seen it, we've heard about it happening, is is uh, when the operators become overwhelmed with too much information coming from an integrated CAD. So you have to sort that out, pick what your most important um, agency that you, you need to receive information, uh, most important or most active or whatever. But I, I don't think you, you know, you can get a... Um, um, uh, you know, many many of that um, agency's integration. Um, uh, you know, and, and each each situation is the same. So I don't think there's any magical answer to that. Uh, if any of the panelists uh, today have have thoughts on that, um, feel free. I know there's some expertise on that as well, um, with between Jim and Scott and uh, and the others. But um, I think that's basically it. it you know, so. Um, Uh, another question we had here was Brian. Um, oh, you already answered Edward. Mark, okay. Um, Brian, is another question. What type of training do CHAMP operators receive to be able to respond to maintenance calls? Yeah, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but that's everything from identifying potholes, um, concrete separation, any kind of roadway issue um, to signs down, drainage issues, uh, anything, at, at bridges, um, looking for clogged weep holes, uh, cable barrier issues, uh, the full gambit. I mean, pretty much anything you need to, to identify out on the roadway, we, we put that in our training for our operators. Any other questions, folks? Um, yeah, we don't, we don't activate all the lines, so we all can't speak up, but if you, if you have... And one thing I did want to mention, I failed to mention, I did want to just re um, reach out to folks. So I am on a mission to um, gather information on the committees that are active throughout the country, just like I, we, I just heard recently about the 20 that um, or 20 that committees that I didn't know about in Georgia. I found out about four in Maine yesterday, or three more in Maine. I knew there was two. Um, so um, um, any, if you have any information about Tim committees that I may not necessarily know about it. I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Um, it's, uh, it's, I'm sort of a collecting Tim committees, if you will. So, um, if you have uh, um, Jim and I are very interested in hearing about this sort of activity, it helps us here at the national level and it helps us get a handle on what what is happening throughout the country. Hey, Paul. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, Jim. Uh, oh, Jim. Along those same lines, and ask to everyone on the line here, 
Uh, if if you are conducting train to trainer sessions in your state, please let Paul and I know uh, because we get um, inquiries all the time from others across the country that are willing to travel, um, you know, out of state even. So uh, I know that that many states are leading their own train to trainer programs, and we or workshops, I should say, and we highly encourage that, uh, but we need you to share that with us as well so that we can share it with others. Uh, similarly, if you are, are interested in conducting your own train-to-trainer programs or workshops, please let us know. Paul and I can give you some, some of the pointers or criteria to do so. Um, and... Um, I want to make a real quick mention, Paul. I know there's only three or four minutes left. It was it was delightful to hear uh, Scott and Brian and everyone, but one of the things that resonated with me is the point that Scott was making about Tim and what we used to refer to. We would make the comment that there would be Tim fatigue out there. And what we're doing, like with everything in life, you know, worthwhile programs, um, it's always a struggle, and so uh, we must not give up the fight, ladies and gentlemen. We have to continue to be innovative and, and, and think out of the box and, and, and keep traffic incident management, good practices, the CAD integration, all these things that we've talked about today and, and some others that we haven't, but we need to keep the benefits of Tim out in the forefront. As Paul was mentioning, make the, the, the Tim case or business case that we've been engaged in, uh, leaders sometimes need to be reminded and uh, the performance measures that you collect by, by having um, them collected in crash reports but also that integration with, with police all leads to this. And we, we must not sit on our laurels. We need to shout out loud and on paper with data-driven data, be able to make the case for why Tim is so important and, and, and why it, it goes to highway safety and, and why it saves lives and, and reduces injuries and, and, of course, congestion. So I can't emphasize that enough, uh, friends. So uh, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I, I think the fatigue... Um it is depending on where you are because there's a lot of activity throughout the country and I think you have to fight against the fatigue. I think you're hundred percent correct and, and Scott is 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 um is correct and identify that. But there's still a lot of activity that's still it's like it goes in cycles because I know there's some other states that weren't very active uh, but not I now. So um I just wanted to mention um uh, that uh, under Sal's Cohen name Elizabeth has told us that she's got um, a train the trainer um in New Jersey going on and um, so it, it's good if we if you if you got a if you're planning on a train the trainer send Jim, Jim an email me uh, but but mostly Jim uh, we would like to know because we get like we just had a, a request yesterday about someone that's looking for a train the trainer it's just one one person I think he's in Montana or South Dakota I think and you know but so the more information we have on that the better we're able to you know maybe get someone there that might be out of state or something like that and and, and participate so um, I know uh, one of those programs with this active a lot of activity is um, is Texas because we're going to be featuring them next month and there's going to be two other speakers that I'm honing in on I think we might um, have a presentation on from Ohio on the trip program, but I haven't confirmed that yet, and then I'm not sure what the other one is. But I'm going to get that information out to you shortly. Please share the information um, on the webinars. We um, we've had great attendance, and and and, um, and and I think there's something to be learned. We're going to make a, a, a strong effort, um, Jim and I, in making sure that we we're sharing valuable information. Um, and I hope we did that today. So. Um, uh, uh, looks like uh, Wisconsin has uh, trained the trainer August sixth and seventh. So um, see, there's just uh, two, right? Um, and, and Angela is saying there's one in Arizona. So um, you guys are not keeping us informed out there. So, um, uh, but thanks so much for your partnership, everybody. Adam, is there anything else we need to uh, to share, or, or are we able to close it out? 
able to close it out. Uh, just a reminder, uh, sign up for the newsletter to, to get all the updates on the recording and presentation uh, materials for this. Yeah, excellent point. Another one, train the trainer in Texas. So, um, but uh, great, thank I, you. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, outside of this webinar, if you could send us an email as well, anyone else, uh, we we could we sure could use the information. So, thanks hey, again, Paul, everybody. Shout out to, yeah. Paul, shout out to Grady Carrick in Florida, who was extremely helpful for today's webinar too. Grady's a huge friend. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, thanks, Jim, for covering that one that I was missing. I appreciate that. So, um, uh, and John Paul Cartier, the captain out of Arizona State Police, is is asking what what can I do for Paul today? And that's how I like to start and end my meetings. And I think we'll start the <laughs> webinars that way. What can I do for Paul? Thanks, uh, uh, Captain Cartier out of Arizona. So, with that, everyone have a great day and. Um, and uh, we'll all talk to you soon and don't and stay tuned for next month great great call thanks very much be safe yeah.